Welcome to SSR Meetup. Today we have with us John Phillips from 460 Degrees, and he will be explaining to us um, how SSI can be explained to SSI uh, for C suite executives and any, anyone else for that matter. Um, this is a very beautiful presentation that we're having today. Um, I got in touch with John like three, four months ago, and um, his, he and his team, they produced a wonderful video where they explained in a very quick way um, how to explain SSI, and I found it so exciting that they produced this that, and that I asked John, hey, can, could you please do a presentation for the SSI Meetup um, community and the world um, about how you did this and how this works and just explain it with the slide deck so that people around the world can reuse it. You will have a link also to the video that um, John did um, in this presentation. And uh, let us quickly review in the next slide uh, what SSI Meetup is about so that you can, uh, for those of you that are joining this for the first time, you can see a little bit what SSI Meetup is about. So what we are trying to do is to empower global SSI communities. This is open to everyone. If you're a person, a, a company, or an association, whatever it is, you can reuse this material around the world. And um, we have a Creative Commons by Share Like license, which allows you to reuse this material. The only thing you have to do is to give credit back to the person that created this. Today, it is John Phillips from um, 460 degrees and give also please credit back to SSI Meetup. And this material is being actively used around the world and in, in, in going from going to all continents in reality, like Europe, South America, Asia, all over the place. I'm, and we're really happy that this is happening because um, yeah, it helps spread the word about SSI and people to learn and to use this material freely. And that's exactly what we try to encourage. If you have any questions during the presentation, please bring up um, those questions with me and I'll share them with um, um, John, or we can have questions at the end. Usually we do these sessions in, in the evening in, in the European time zone. This is the first time we're doing one in the morning in the European time zone. And so if you're watching this um, afterwards, Enjoy it and please let uh, let us know your questions um, in social media or on our Telegram channel, whatever you want, um, because um, I really would like to know what, what you think about this, because I think it will be really helpful to share the message, message about SSI. And yeah, I think this is the whole intro. John, thank you so much for joining us today from Australia and for making the effort in producing all this material and sharing it with everyone. And uh, we very much look forward to this. Thank you very much, Alex. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity. So um, I hope I can live up to your introduction. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go through these slides. The, the, uh, the video that um, Alex is referring to actually is a, a, what we do when we meet people in, in person. It only takes us about seven minutes. So these slides will take more than seven minutes, but we'll have the core of them at one point. We'll talk about the story we use. So you'll see that sort of six or seven minute um, description as well. So um, we, as in the 460 Degrees and myself and my team, have been trying to find ways to explain SSI for about three years now. Um, and I think that's probably true for a number of other people uh, that are working in SSI or maybe listening to this call, that the we is both the global SSI community and I guess the we is probably you if you're listening to this or, or reading these, these slides. Um, we think we found a better way to explain it quite recently, uh, towards the end of last year. Um, but I'll explain how we got there, the kind of journey we took to, uh, to find our way to an, a simpler explanation for SSI, and then also where, where we think there's still um, uh, places to navigate and things to find out. And of course, it's, it's a journey. There's a lot more still to discover. Um, for us, for 460 Degrees, we, we started like most uh, in terms of trying to understand the technology uh, that underpins self-sovereign identity. So, we learned about DIDs and DID docs and verifiable credentials, Hyperledger, it's Indie, and then Aries and Ursa, Byzantine Consensus, Zero Knowledge Proof, Sovereign W3C, and all the other elements that constitute the kind of whole e uh, ecosystem of self sovereign. Uh, we have really enjoyed connecting with a number of people in the community and the organizations, uh, and uh, it's a very collaborative community. It's a great group of people working this globally. And we don't doubt that we have to keep learning and keep sharing uh, from going forward. So it, it's a moving piece, as Alex and I were talking about before we started. And there's a lot of technology still to learn. Uh, in our uh, experience in 2018, we, we were trying to sort of finesse our approach. So we, we were using the presentations that many of you will have been familiar with that talk about the internet not being made with an identity layer, that, that often used little cartoon of a dog and a keyboard. Um, the, the fact that digital identity is a problem for people and organizations, phrases like toxic data uh, and so on. So 
we we have well over 60 presentations that we've created over those years uh, our master deck is well over 200 slides and that's not including the ones i'm showing to you today um, and we never use it in full so we try it very hard to use normal kind of techniques to present ssi in 2019 just last year um, we we kind of started investing at the very beginning of the year in the technology itself so we went from uh, standing on uh, stages and presentations and in front of whiteboards to realizing we wanted to put the technology in people's hands uh, to show them it was real. And this is within Australia. I know a lot of you around the world have, by this time have already got some technology you could display, but we didn't have it locally. So we, we invested in uh, partnerships with companies like Ebonim. We downloaded the software from Hyperledger. We create our own little small demos and that enabled us to show uh, how the technology works. And we're still investing in that exploratory way uh, right now so that from our point of view, we can then talk to a client with, with uh, informed kind of confidence that yes, this is the way the technology works and this particular uh, wallet is capable of communicating with this particular layer and so on. Uh, it, for us, it's really about the, the confidence and knowledge that we can express when we're talking to our clients. The trouble for us though, was this tech-led approach really wasn't working very well for, from our experience. We, we, we tended to get more questions to fire at us than we could answer in the time we had. We would kind of get distracted. And I think there was a number of reasons which I'm gonna explore in the next couple of slides. I think in, in a fundamental way, we were solving for the wrong problem, which means that we were, we were trying to explain exactly how the technology works, but that wasn't exactly what we needed to do. Um, if you consider the way we are all now um, both dependent on uh, and enjoy, if that's possible, the way the internet works and the various services that are provided, we seldom explain the internet by talking about the requests for comments that underpin it and the, and the standards and the TCP IP suite. And if you imagine trying to explain the internet's TCP IP suite uh, through RFCs to a bunch of AOL engineers way back in the 80s or 90s, then you can kind of imagine this might be a bit of a problem. Um, so I, my kind of premise is I don't think explaining how the internet works is a good way of telling people how things might be for them when they when they get a downstream service like a Netflix or something. So I think we were solving for the wrong problem for most of the audiences. Now I want to have a quick sort of uh, uh, call out to Alex and the team here because um, I, I'm going to sort of say there's some things that are missing in SSI Meetup, but I actually think SSI Meetup is a brilliant resource and a growing resource. Um, I think there's a, a there's a gap, if you like. I think this is a great place to come to to learn a lot of things about the technology and to come back to again to remind yourself and so on. And, and it's 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 great. It'll get greater, um, but I think there's a gap. And my observation is we have a lot of material that explains how the technology works, and that material is necessary. It's essential, and it's growing. But we have very few examples of uh, how the SSI experience uh, actually feels. Um, so we'll have people telling us how um, their system works, how a particular operational example works, um, and they'll talk about some technology, but talking about the experience isn't done that often. Uh, and so I, I think we all share a goal that we want SSI to succeed, irrespective of our role in an organization, whatever, we're here for a purpose, which is one of the great things about SSI. Um, it needs to work technically, it needs to have all of the rigor and, and trustworthiness that it deserves. Um, but we also need to be able to explain it and we need to win organizations and people over. We, we've got to find a way of explaining a society that helps these people understand what it means. Uh, and to do that, we're going to have to share ideas about kind of what's working and what's not working when we explain a society. And that's effectively what this whole presentation is about. So why doesn't starting with the tech work? So I, I suggest that you should think about your audience, which is a, a, kind of a standard sort of uh, suggestion for all people presenting. If your audience is a technologist uh, with experience in digital identity, they're most likely experienced in traditional identity and access management systems. So if you've approached an organization saying, we've got this fantastic new way of thinking about digital identity or trust or, or login or whatever else you've, you've suggested to them, they'll probably put their technologists forward into that meeting. And their technologists will be security experts or they'll be IDAM experts, but they'll have a frame set of knowledge and experience that is, will, in a sense, prejudice the way they receive your message. If they have a blockchain uh, fascination, then they'll be thinking about cryptocurrencies and smart contracts everywhere. If they're the business executive, then they'll be wondering whether you're posing a threat or an opportunity to them in their role or their business as a whole. Um, so these are the kind of perspectives that you're dealing with when you when you kind of try and explain a society to an organization. 
Now, for the technologists um, and others, they tend to drift and, and hear things the way they want to hear them. So here I'm really talking to uh, things like cognitive biases. So the way people frame a conversation based on their own mental model of, of how things work. Uh, they may use availability bias or uh, um, a kind of um, self-fulfilling prophecies about how they hear things. So technologists will see everything through the lenses uh, that they've used the last 10 or 20 years. Blockchain people keep looking for crypto wallets and thinking that we're writing personal identifiable information to a blockchain or we're monetizing personal data. And business people get bored within about six seconds. So you've really got to try and grab their attention. If you start with a slide deck, and there is a smile on my face as I'm saying this because I'm running through a slide deck for tonight. Um, the problem with them is that they are like a, a rail game in, in an online gaming system. You have no choice but to follow this path and you start on this path and you finish on this path. So it's a risky proposition to use a deck. Um, and if you start with a deck, you really need to have room if you can to wiggle around. Um, but so starting with a presentation for me doesn't kind of work. It doesn't engage the audience. So we, we needed to find a way to engage people. And heaven forbid you try to explain those, those three so important words of self, sovereign and identity. If you start with that at the beginning of your presentation, you probably won't finish. I, I really enjoyed and I enjoyed the thinking that Philip Sheldrake and others sort of provide us on, on the, the meaning of these words and how we should think about them and, and, and extensibility of these things. I also know I can get easily distracted uh, by these considerations. So I'm following the path that says, when we talk about SSI in front of organizations we want to convince to use SSI, we need to talk about the use of it um, for the good of all, as opposed to um, the meaning of the word self and sovereign of an identity. From our perspective, we saw all of these issues as a need to humanize the conversation, to sort of simplify and demystify. Um, so we, we were finding that we were getting derailed before we could get far into the discussion. Um, we needed to get a common understanding with people. We were finding, uh, certainly towards the uh, end of 2019, that some people we would meet would say they already know about SSI. Of course, you were never sure when you start the conversation just how much they did know or what their interpretation of SSI was. So we wanted to present a kind of way of getting to a clean and simple SSI and away from any risk of what we might call, or others are calling SSI washing, where something that isn't SSI is being claimed as SSI. So in 2019, we did two things in, in parallel. Um, we went into some external research. I, I have a, 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 I'm lucky to have a connection to a lot of the academic community in Australia through the work I've done. And so we explored those connections. Uh, we wanted to see how the students and academics of those universities could help us. And we kind of did our own internal workshops. We, we did our own re retrospective uh, and thought about what was working, what wasn't working. With the universities, we explored projects with students. Um, and those were in Australia, they're called capstone projects. That's a, a final year undergraduate uh, degree, may have a major program of work that lasts for the whole semester or trimester. So say 10 or 12 weeks. That project is typically a group project and the students are given a challenge that, in a, that they are meant to be more or less self-directed in solving. Um, and we gave two universities and two groups of students a, a, the challenge of, of understanding and explaining and working with SSI. One group was a cybersecurity uh, group of students and the other was a set of UX design students. We learned lots from the experience of doing that during last year. We also co-invested and are still working with um, Swinburne University in their smart cities group with uh, an area that's called digital wallets and smart cities. And that's actually, I think, going to be really important. It, um, it, it came out of a, a conversation we were having with that university that says that smart cities as they are currently implemented are too often a kind of um, nest of sensors that uh, are trying to watch people and hear people and sense the temperature of people and count people and do the stuff that's or treating people as if they were kind of ants in an ant's nest. And um, the, the kind of algorithms and, the, and the, the computers on top decide that there's too many people queuing for pedestrian crossings so they make the lights go green. And, and our phrasing, which is deliberately colorful, we describe this as being a digital deity or a digital god. And our argument to Swinburne was we should try to recover a bit of equality in the way smart cities work as opposed to the inequality that they risk going now. That led to this, um, this investigation we're doing with them, which is this uh, 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 looking at smart cities and the, uh, what a, a digital wallet might mean. I'm speaking to you from Melbourne at the moment, Melbourne in Australia. 
So we coined the idea of a Melbourne wallet, and that's what we're exploring. We've had now two workshops with uh, groups of people from the general public and a number of interviews being done by Swinburne. And I'm really looking forward to the kind of academic research that they come out with and the work we can do with that. I think it's going to be quite exciting. Um, the University Capstone projects, uh, I, I think the one that I, I'm well, very happy to share, probably uh, offline with the Connect, is around the Swinburne University's design students. They came up with some brilliant ways of looking at how SSI can be explained. Um, and the smart cities, uh, we are still learning so much from that. Um, what, what I can say of that is that uh, my colleague Joe, uh, colleague and friend Joe Spencer and I learned so much by sitting in on those workshops that the we live in a bubble with the people who are focused on digital identity. We believe that it's all known, that people are kind of walk around thinking about it the whole time. Well, they don't. Very few people understand what a digital wallet really is, or indeed what happens when they use things online and they use identity online. So we have to kind of reset our thinking about how we would explain to the general public what SSI might mean for them. So that's one of the first key learnings, and there'll be many more coming out of that program. But today, I want to focus on the story that got Alex's attention. Um, and that really came out of the, the second or third visit we had with the Swinburne University students, where we were trying to explain SSI to them um, in, in a way that was appropriate and simple enough. So we played with some concepts that we had in our office. So we, uh, my team and I, uh, and others at 460 are fans of human-centered design and uh, done some work in that area, um, innovation and a thing that Google Ventures uh, uh, produced called Sprint, which you can look up online. It's a, a published method that they use. And we looked in our, uh, our craft drawer and uh, the station cupboard, and we came up with a bunch of figures and characters and pipe cleaners and other things. Um, and we wrote a simple story. Now, I use the word story deliberately, and it's not to make it sort of demeaning or, 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 or kind of uh, childlike, if you like. It's because stories are incredibly powerful at all levels of society. Uh, we all remember things best, no matter how deep tech we are, when they're told as a story. Um, I'm, again, I'm speaking to you from Australia. This is the, 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 the home for peoples that are arguably the oldest civilizations in the world of over 40,000 years of history, which has been maintained through storytelling, through oral storytelling. Uh, I, I kind of hope you get a sense of just how powerful stories are if these people have managed to keep their, their sense of cultural identity going for 40,000 years by telling stories. So critically and very importantly, we want to give our story a human angle. So we will give our characters a name and a backstory. So you'll hear me say later, meet Jackie. She's a successful young adult living in an apartment Jackie has just got a new job and wants to move nearer to work. So we give a very short little uh, intro to the character, but we need to make it human and uh, interesting enough for people to start paying attention. You can think of this as sort of mixing um, the kind of use case thinking uh, with personas and human-centered design, but I have a, a, a provocative point of view I want to share, which is I think the way we normally use use cases is completely useless. It's it's the result of some well-meaning people analyzing a bunch of stuff and kind of drawing the thing out. But once it's drawn, it rarely has any kind of purpose beyond that first image. Um, so I kind of think we, we don't make best use of use cases or we haven't used them the right way somehow. Um, and I think the other part that's important for me is this human-centered design aspect. So um, uh, design thinking, human-centered design in particular, is, is a, a process that's designed to solve wicked problems. Uh, wicked problem is a particular definition of a problem type and for this conversation, I'll say that it's, it's basically technically complicated, but socially and politically complex. And um, by using these words, I'm making them particularly important there. Um, they are part of a way of thinking that's called the Carnarfon model. And the, the slides will have some notes that will give you links to where that is. But it's a way of thinking about different kinds of problems from simple to complicated to complex and chaotic. And uh, complex means that the cause and effect aren't uh, directly related. Um, so the, this is an area of, of digital identity is an area that is particularly uh, emotionally bound to people and politically complicated, uh, to, sorry, complex and technically complicated. By complicated, it means we can solve it. We just need to work out the problems. Complex means something else. It means it's going to, it has more kind of more uh, challenges to it than just complication. The other thing about the, the way we'll tell the story is it's a bit like a business story. Um, that's, a, that's actually a, a, a thing that people will pay to be taught. Um, there's a great company in Australia called Anecdote that does this kind of stuff. It's taught a lot of people in the 460. Um, and they will tell you that there is a very simple structure to most stories. Uh, this used to be the case, then this happened, 
so we're doing this so we can achieve this and that's the way they would coach a, a business story to be told and that's a little similar to the way we take on this story about jackie if you're a, a consultant and i confess i am or have been um, you also are familiar with this idea of situation complication resolution often thought of also as the minto pyramid we're using something like that but we're actually kind of reverting it a little uh, uh, change the order a bit so we go situation resolution complication and we put the complication last and you'll see why when we get to it now um i'm kind of doing this as if i'm doing the real thing and at this point i normally ask permission to tell the story because we've sat down at a meeting with a bunch of executives um their time is very busy we're about to bring out some things that as you see them will look quite um uh, potentially amusing i suppose but they're, they're, we don't want to belittle the conversation we want to give it this due uh, importance so we ask their permission to tell a story that will take about seven minutes and we'll explain this aside in a way that will get us all on the same page and that hopefully will allow us to have a, a very sort of valuable conversation going forward and we can of course after that describe how the technology works discuss the business models and any technical questions so we then ask their permission is that okay and invariably they will say yes because most people are polite and most people are actually kind of interested by this point point. and then we'll tell them that the story will have three parts uh, we're going to talk about the current physical world and that's a world they're going to be used to seeing experiencing that they've seen their children if they're older or that they themselves are still experiencing and then we'll say the second part is we'll show you how the ssi world will work and it will look quite similar to the, the current world but it'll be a bit better and then in part three we talk about how the current digital world works and that's the bit that uh, is the the uh, complication if you like the broken nature of centralized and federated systems and to do we're doing that to try and give a call for action that's why we leave it last that call for action means we want them to do something this is our ssi demo kit uh, it's a picture of it but it it is as beaten up as it looks um I, and i do probably need to get a new envelope um but uh it's been traveling around in my bag for the last ooh, four or five months i've got various versions of it one with jason one with jackie um and there was a mark one uh, and so on so it's had a couple of iterations and we're going to see it in action so part one is going to be about the world we live in now and the question we're exploring or the the theme is um what's it like to rent a new apartment now so meet jackie She's a successful young adult living in an apartment. Jackie has just got a new job and wants to move nearer to work. Now, Jackie, uh, like most young adults, has accumulated a few things over her time, one of which is a driving license, and she also pays some bills for the apartment that she's living in. She keeps the driving license in her wallet and the bills in a drawer of a desk at her apartment. Now, these artifacts, these physical artifacts, are credentials. They state who issued them, who they were sent to, and any other information relevant to the purpose. So this particular credential is, is to Jackie from the, a company called Utility, which we made up, of course, and inside that is a bunch of stuff about the utility bill that she needs to pay and some details like address and so on that are useful for identification. Now, Jackie's found an apartment she likes and it's rented by a company called Highly Rated Rentals. So she wants to go to Highly Rated Rentals to rent the apartment. Now, Highly Rated Rentals tell Jackie they'd love to rent her the apartment, but she needs to provide some identity information and her bank account details. And the two pieces that she currently has, they don't have any bank account details, so she needs to get something else. Now, Jackie has just opened a new account at a bank, so she's going to go to them and ask them for an account statement, a physical account statement that she can then show to the others. So she takes these three documents with her to the rental agency, and the rental agency take copies of everything. And I, uh, that is quite literally what does happen. Uh, even if you send, certainly in Australia, if you send a scanned PDF image, or if you send, if you bring the physical documents with you, they will take copies. Uh, Jackie uh, hopes very much that they keep these copies very securely. Uh, I have a, a worry in my mind still around the, the, the possibility of, uh, of a number of rental agencies being kind of hacked because they do hold very interesting information for people that want to do identity theft. Now, some time later, um, the rental agency perform all the checks they need to perform. And they call Jackie and tell her that everything went through okay. And can she come back to the office to sign the agreement, pay the bond, which is the, the first payment you had to make to get the flat, and pick up the keys. 
So Jackie goes back to the office, she does the payments and she signs the contract and she gets the keys um, and she's got everything and she's very happy with the stuff and she now has a new document or a rental agreement that she can store in her drawer in the new apartment. And that's it, that's the world where most of us currently live in. It's, a, it's a, an experience that I think most people, if they rent, have been through themselves. Um, it's an experience I know that um, I've helped my children go through. We use physical documents to prove things and we receive physical documents in return. So we're gonna talk about the SSI world now and it'll be quite like the current experience, but a bit better. Uh, I'm being a bit um, uh, economical with my praise here. It's a lot better, but we'll say a bit better. First, we're gonna give Jackie a really super fancy digital wallet, which is, as you can see, another beaten up envelope. Um, now, the, the, the app or the, the wallet is normally like an app on your phone, um, but it can be any SSI capable secure storage device. If you were kind of really concerned about stuff, you could probably write this to a USB stick and bury it in your garden. It wouldn't be quite as useful as having it on your phone, but it's kind of gonna be up to you. But the digital wallets is a secure place to store your credentials. So these physical documents that we looked at before, we're now gonna have as verifiable credentials. So these are a uh, digital credential that's cryptographically signed by the issuer and addressed to Jackie. So she can share these credentials in the same way she could with the physical credentials with anyone she chooses, but with um, the world of digital credentials, she can do the whole of them as she would do with a physical document, or she can share just a part of them, or she can even prove that she actually just has the credentials. So for example, she could say, I have a driving license, I can prove I have a driving license, and that's all you need to know. So now when she goes to Highly Rated Rentals and says she wants to rent the apartment, Highly Rated Rentals say they'd love to rent the apartment to her, um, and they can do all the checks that they need to do in seconds, not days, but they will still need the same information. And this is an important point. From our perspective, we don't see SSI changing the law uh, and we don't think it needs to, uh, which is actually a great asset for SSI. Um, it means that we can carry on with the same sort of uh, infrastructure and processes and governance without having too much disruption, but with a better, a better experience. So now Highly Rated Rental sends what we're gonna call a proof request to Jackie's wallet. Now that means that her, her phone, if it's a phone, will uh, pick up a message saying that Highly Rated Rentals have sent you a proof request. They want to know the following details and the wallet will tell her which of um, her credentials will answer the questions that are being asked, and it will tell her if there are questions being asked for which she has no credentials. So she still needs to confirm her bank account details, so she connects with a new fancy uh, high-tech bank, and she gets them to send her a credential, a verifiable credential of her account, and that arrives in her wallet. And she sticks it inside her envelope, or in fact, her app on the phone. Um, and now with her proof request, she can actually provide a proof response back to highly rated rentals. Um, and the proof response is a cryptographically signed uh, document sent by Jackie back to highly rated rentals contains the three things they asked about. So for each of the credentials that Jackie has uh, shared back to highly rated rentals, they can do four checks. They can find out who issued the credential. Was it a known and trusted issuer, um, a company that they know, or they can find on a list? Was it issued to Jackie? So is it hers to give? Uh, did she borrow her brother's phone? Um, has she done something that it wasn't actually hers and now she's showing it to them? Has she changed it in any way? Has she given herself more or less money in her bank account for whatever reasons or changed some other details? And has it been revoked? Now, the revocation in this instance might not be quite so important, um, but say if you were doing something like hiring a car, then obviously it might be important to know whether your driving license has been revoked. Now, they do these checks by checking the signatures of the issuing authority and any revocation list they publish. Now, um, I'll flip into not telling the story. You can see the ledger that we use is actually a bunch of what we call lollipop sticks, and we've written the names of the issuing authorities on the lollipop sticks, and we bring these out at this point in the story in front of the audience to say this is the ledger, <clears throat> and this is, or rather, the, the secure storage, and this is where the uh, verifying uh, uh, highly rated rentals can find the the documents that they need to find to prove who issued this and test it, whether it's been revoked and so on. Now they can do all that without asking the issuing authority directly. And that's important because if you were to ask directly, you would be in a sense breaching privacy between uh, yourself and with, um, with Jackie. So on these, uh, on the ledger, on this trusted uh, uh, secure storage is a um, uh, these public signatures and any other information as 
the, the audience here will know things like verifiable credential definitions or revocation lists. There are already 32 different places uh, that you can store the, the, the trusted sort of public keys or did docs as we would use the words. Um, and that number will no doubt grow. Um, so it means you could store these, these signatures on things like, a, a, if you choose to, a Bitcoin or Ethereum, but more likely perhaps a sovereign or IPFS or other methods um, of which there are many for dids. Now, the verifiable credential includes a pointer to the public information. So when that, that's the thing that allows highly rated registers to look up the, um, the information. Now the issuers have a choice over where they store things. That we don't need all issuers to store things in all the same places. They can they can store them where they where they choose to store them. The key thing is that they has to be a trustworthy location, and that the verifying party can find it. And those are the two very important things. So. Highly rated rentals do all these checks. They do them in seconds, and they are able to offer Jackie a rental agreement, which arrives on her wallet as a new credential being offered by highly rated rentals. And she can choose to accept this or not accept it. Now, she chooses to accept the uh, the offer. That means that the rental agreement goes into her wallet with all the other communications she's had with highly rated rentals, and it means that highly rated rentals get a confirmation that Jackie has accepted the offer. So, if, if it were possible within the legal framework, we could now say that the contract has been agreed. Uh, it might be that for whatever legacy regions, they might need something like a wet signature still. But basically, uh, it is it is a, a now a, a guarantee, if you like, that Jackie has accepted the agreement from highly rated rentals. Jackie still has to physically pick up the keys. The, the, in the story we tell, we don't give a, a kind of electronic key system. Um, so she picks up the keys, she pays the bond, and with a smile on her face, she goes to her new apartment. So the the flow. For Jackie and for the highly rated rentals and, and even the, the other part of the bank is very much the same. It's just more secure, it's more private, and it's more efficient, and it's basically just better. Unfortunately, that's not yet the world that we currently live in digitally in many places. And in fact, we have a digital identity model that we typically describe as having a bit of a broken promise. And there's a, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Let's explore those. So we're going to introduce the sparkly ball. Uh, we normally have this in sort of inside our bag and we bring it out on the table and sort of open our fist out and let it drop onto the table. Always a bit of a, a bit of a sort of surprise factor. Uh, the sparkly ball was something we found in the craft drawer that we were using and it's a prop, if you like, for us for current digital identity systems. It's stuck, but it's, its sparkles aren't sticking very well. So I, I tend to find my bag is full of sparkles and they kind of leave, we leave a legacy wherever we go with this stuff. Now, when we describe a sparkly ball in Australia, uh, we describe it as an identity system or login system, such as login with Facebook or Google or the identity systems of Apple ID, OzPost, Digital ID, MyGov ID. Those last two are kind of Australian special versions. Um, so there, it's an identity system or a login system. Well, uh, it's our euphemism for centralized identity and federated identity systems. Now, for each of these systems, um, we would propose that a common denominator, if you like, is that each of them allocates you with an identity. And I use those words very importantly, allocation. So they give you uh, an identity that you can then use to authenticate yourself to other organizations in the network that recognizes the sparkly ball. So let's go back to Jackie. So Jackie tells a lot of stuff about herself to the sparkly ball, and the sparkly ball gives Jackie an identifier. Uh, when Jackie uses the identifier with a bank, the bank asks the sparkly ball to authenticate it. So if Jackie was using, a, so let's say, an Apple ID and the bank says you can log in with Apple, she offers her Apple ID and the bank now needs to check this Apple ID and they have to check with Apple. Um, so the sparkly ball learns that Jackie is talking to the bank at a date and time. When Jackie uses the same identifier with highly rated rentals, they also ask the sparkly ball to authenticate it and the sparkly ball learns that Jackie is talking to highly rated rentals. In fact, every time Jackie uses the identifier, the sparkly ball knows. Now, some sparkly balls go to a considerable effort to try not to notice and to forget what they learn. For example, Apple has a, a promise in their white paper that they will forget this sort of data after 30 days. And you can see it on page six of the white paper. Um, some blind themselves kind of digitally, um, covering their digital eyes and ears. Um, uh, others don't. Um, and in fact, quite a few others don't. And they use the data they gain about you for their own reasons, None of, most of which aren't necessarily very good, but they're often very commercial. So with good or bad intentions, the architecture of the sparkly ball means that they're always in the loop, kind of whether they want to be or not. It's just a side effect of the architecture. So we don't like sparkly balls. And that's the end of the little Jackie story that we tell. 
So at this point, we're typically uh, having a pretty live conversation with some people. Um, where uh, uh, they've often started picking up the pits and pieces and started asking other questions with lollipop sticks, but the demo is effectively ended. Um, and we normally will now offer to run the software that we have that's available, um, and then we'll start to explore their technical and business questions. Interestingly, quite often, they're less now concerned about the software. People expect the software to work. You wouldn't offer to run it if it doesn't. Um, so the, they, they become less interested in the software and more interested in talking about other things that are actually of importance to them as a business or as an organization. And that's really powerful. That's one of the key kind of benefits we're getting from using this sort of way of talking rather than using the, the tech-led approach that we are using before. So you can find the links on this deck when it's published by Alex on, on the, on the uh, SSI meetup. Um, the original link to the, the post I gave on, on LinkedIn, which contained the video, is the first link. We've actually done a slightly better recording. The first one was done just for internal purposes only by one um, iPhone or something. We did one with sophisticated with two cameras, it's still very, very homely, very simple. And we've even built things like cartoon versions. And very, very excitingly, Jack, Joe, and I, who are the team for uh, SSI 460, did a human sized version of the meetup where we got people to stand up and be Jackie and the rental agent and the bank and wear placards around their necks and hand stuff over and so on. And so we actually kind of role played it at a physical level. And I think that's actually a very interesting way to do it for large groups because they can't see these small little figures that we use when we put them on the desk. The other thing we're doing is I've just done one story about Jackie. There are many stories we can write about Jackie. We could give Jackie the challenge of uh, either buying a new car, um, traveling through passport control, um, doing other things that are kind of challenging or, or life worthy, or even doing a simple thing like going to a university and enrolling at a university, not that that's necessarily so simple, but we can do, uh, we can use this sort of way of talking about SSI for all the other things that Jackie might do. Um, we continue to look for new ways to support the adoption of SSI as a team as 460 degrees. So we're, we're still sponsoring research with um, with the universities on, on um, uh, the research we're doing in Swinburne, we're looking at other types of research as well, and we're looking to do more capstone projects. Joe and I are, are, are proud to be co-chairs of the Sovereign Guardianship Working Group, which is looking at a, another problem, if you like, that needs to be resolved uh, in a very human uh, way for, for um, all of us. Um, we are very active in explaining SSI to government and industry bodies, both locally and, and further afield. Um, and we are, are actually about promoting the commercial trial adoption of SSI. We're not actually a charity. Um, we, do, we do need to make money um, and we do work with commercial organizations. Now, we are very much still learning a bunch of stuff. Uh, and that's a call out to you and anybody that's looking at this deck or listening to this video, uh, is that we really would like to connect. Uh, we'd love to hear what's working with you or not working with you. We wanna learn more. And at the very end of the, the deck, you'll see a whole list of uh, the contact details for everyone on the team. And I'd encourage you to reach out. Now, finally, Alex gave me a, a, a challenge, not a challenge actually, he asked me to give a list of books that I've read that would help me understand, or helped me understand identity better. And I thought about this for a while today, and I thought everything I've read almost is about identity, not, not deliberately, but with, with hindsight. Every story you read is about identity in some way or another. Um, so this is, uh, and I'm an avid reader, so this is a, a condensed list, believe it or not, of some of the things I've read and some of the more recent ones. Just a couple of highlights, the things that are in, on my screen, at least in bright pink, the Rachel Botsman book, Who Can You Trust? And the Shoshana Zuboff book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, are two of the call outs I typically make at a, at a conference or a panel discussion or whatever, as sort of books that will shape your thinking. And I, I normally use these as uh, examples for commercial organizations to be aware of, of what I would suggest is a kind of um, a growing wave of, of rese resentment by the general public about what's happening with data about themselves and, and the risks that they're for organizations that misappropriate data face. And the others are all of various interesting kind of points. Um, uh, I, I guess the, the funniest one on the list is probably the Ben Elton identity crisis. The most powerful one, if you're listening to podcasts, will be the work of Kwame Anthony Appiah. And you can digest that quite easily in four bite-sized chunks on the Reef Lectures podcast. And there's a link that you'll see in the deck for that. And there's a bunch of other things that obviously I love reading. So that's it. This is the team. Uh, we are genuinely driven um, passionately about SSI. Um, we, we consider ourselves to be students and evangelists and enablers. Um, we won't lose that student moniker. We, we uh, understand that we'll always need to learn. Um, we generally think it's a better model for privacy, security, and trust for people, organizations, and things. 
and we know it's disruptive but if we think it's a powerful good so uh, that's that's us we uh, we'd love to be a catalyst for that powerful good that's and wonderful that's um john thank you so much this was really good um, i have a question coming in here from from peter he's asking what is your business model and and how do you provide services to companies in australia so, so for the 460 degrees SSI team's business model, we, we would, it's probably easiest to think of us as a, a kind of consulting organization is, is probably the, the closest metaphor. Um, so what that means is that um, we will expect to help an organization understand how SSI might work for them. So go through design thinking, workshops, whatever, identify areas that are, have some sort of value proposition for that organization. We would then expect to help them test that to do some sort of uh, prototyping or proof of value kind of experiments. Assuming that those realize a, a genuine opportunity for commercial gain and an operation, at that point we'll need to start working with the uh, the kind of uh, companies that are building out platforms within the SSI community because we're not at the moment intending to be a, a platform provider and the companies, that, the organizations we work with will need to look for 24-7 support and a high availability and so on. So at that point, we'll need to start working into the, the community in terms of enabling them to partner up with the organizations we face. But So we, we provide the consulting expertise, so um, we will typically do engagements that help people uh, achieve certain outcomes. Okay, and a question from Philip. He's asking, what other stories are you planning to, to develop, or is this the only story that you have right now? Uh, well, it's the, mo it's the most frequently told story we have right now, and I, I kind of... Uh, I, I can't think of how many times I've told this Jackie story, but we do have others, and I think it's important that we do. So what, what we do now is we consider for each of the meetings we're facing with the clients, um, and we, there are many different kinds of organizations we're talking to, what story would make sense for them? Now, if we have the time, we'll actually write out the new deck of cards, if you like, that go with that story. Um, so uh, the stories could be uh things like government grant systems to provide in, uh, encouragement for kids to do sports um or they could be uh things to do with property acquisition and, and so on there's a number of different flavors to the stories the common factors will be we'll typically use a, a, a jackie or a jason but if you notice there's a theme here that the, the members of my team are all lettered j john joe and jack so our characters typically start with j but yes there are other stories um uh, and that we use the story metaphor for what, what often people have as a use case. Okay. If anyone has any other questions, please bring them in. And last question just from me. Um, I, I'm, I'm under the impression that the Australian and New Zealand ecosystem in SSI is pretty strong and active as it is maybe in Northern Europe and, and North America. Um, if, if, if that's the case, um, what, what, um, how would you describe the Australian and um, New Zealand SSI ecosystem? Wh who, who's driving it? Um, which people and companies are participating? Who are making the most noise to, to push this forward? I mean, together with you, obviously. <laughs> well, yes, we, we're, we're certainly pushing. I think the I, I think Australia and New Zealand are, 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 are both they're very close to each other in a sense geographically. Nothing is that close to either. We're a long way from many people, but the um, the, the, the the closest local uh, uh, communities. And the um, yet there are quite subtle differences between the two countries. Um, I, I would actually suggest that New Zealand is more um, more flexible and responsive than Australia. That you could argue that's because of kind of a momentum, the numbers of people living in each country. Um, there's, you know, uh, I won't give the exact numbers. Let's say it's 5 million in New Zealand, it's 25 million in Australia. Um, so th that sort of gives more momentum and, and, and inertia to the Australian system and more potential flexibility to the New Zealand system. Um, so they're somewhat different. In, in terms of who's, who the movers and shakers are, um, we, we're very pleased to be working with Matter in New Zealand who are, who are doing a lot of work. And if you've been to the Internet Identity Workshops and others, you'll see them present there. Uh, and they're, they're a, great, uh, a great sort of new company doing a lot of work on the sort of technology and platform side of things. And we're working with them more on the kind of explaining side of things. I, I think in terms of SSI in Australia, there is a it is an, a, a rapidly in, a, a increasing kind of discussion space, but we do face some interesting um, in, uh, implementations that have already happened. So I mentioned um, a DTA TDIF, um, the MyGov ID. Uh, there's also this the Australian Payments Network uh, Trust ID. So there are frameworks that are being proposed that have a more uh, kind of um, legacy kind of structure based on Open ID Connect and so on. Um, for which we need to find a roadmap uh, forwards that we would love to be SSI. So there's work to do here. It, it isn't sort of um, 
uh, it isn't uh, uh, easier than anywhere else. I'm sure everybody else has their own challenges, but you know, we're very we're very pleased to be working here. Thank you. Um, just one question that came in from Sebastian too. He's asking, when pushback from companies whose business models rely on holding onto personal data will be immense, how can we start to tackle this issue? Oh, that's a great question, Sebastian. I think, I guess there's, there's, two, there's two ways we can think about this. One is don't work with companies with whom you disagree. Uh, you, I mean, in a sense, you could take that purist view. We may not be able to uh, afford to do so. Um, but I think the other is to help them understand that unless they are in the business of what we might call the surveillance economy, in other words, making money out of knowing things about people that perhaps those people don't know you know, um, if, if their business model is, is a, a kind of more uh, more equitable kind of, we know stuff about you so we can help you do things, um, then it's entirely plausible for them to provide the data back to the customer. So one of the stories we normally tell banks here in Australia, and I'm sure it's true for most financial institutions, um, is that they, they, they have been running a thing that's called the Single Customer View Project. Um, and that project is it's called perhaps different words, but Single Customer View is it's, it's the outcome it seeks to achieve for maybe the last 16 or 20 years. And the size of banks here in Australia means that that project has been costing them between, say, two and four million dollars a year for the last 16 to 20 years. It hasn't finished and it won't ever finish. That project is trying to scrape the data across all these different sort of product silos to identify the same individual across all these silos to now know what it is that this particular person is doing with the bank. And that's not for an AML, a CTF kind of anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing issue. That's so they can provide a better service or more products or, or whatever to that customer. Our argument to them is that you could take all that data, those product informations, provide them back to the customer as a self-sovereign model, and then ask the customer themselves to give you the single customer view. So that the data you carry could be in a, both toxic, and it's, it's a risk because you can be hacked or a target for hackers, and it can be uh, costly for you to process and to manage, um, and why don't you, in a sense, give it back to the customer and ask them to have a more equitable relationship with you, um, where you can be sure that the data they give you is accurate for them. So their address is their address, the telephone number is their telephone number, their current email, if you're going to use email, is their, is their email address. So there's a, we would typically argue uh, that there are reasons why you might want to divest yourself of this data, but if they are, in a sense, purely driven by the kind of surveillance economy, then I, I don't know that SSI is going to be something that's attractive to them. Thank you so much. Um, last question from, oh, and there's another one coming in from Michael, so let, let's give priority to Michael. Um, what is backup recoverability of SSI? Uh, well, that's probably one of the things that's better, that, that can be reasonably well argued in the in the technology sort of discussions. So one of the uh, obvious real realizations when you start thinking about giving somebody a, something of value, a digital credential inside a, a, a wallet that's on a device like a phone is that we will lose our phones. We will drop them in places that we shouldn't drop them uh, and things will happen. This is the human condition. So immediately that you consider that the need for a digital verifiable credential, you need to think about backups, uh, you need to think about key recovery and you need to think about these other aspects. And the area that uh, is addressing a number of those is the decentralized key management um, standard, DKMS, which if you look at one of the earlier meetups, you'll find references to, I think it was a Drummond Reed presentation, but it also demands, of course, that you have um, agent services or agency uh, sort of services providing you support so that you can, in fact, back up your wallet um, and recover your wallet across a number of devices and do things like revoke a device. If I were to leave my phone in an Uber, I need to be able to revoke my phone on the off chance that somebody can open it and so that it, it doesn't allow them access to anything else. Um, so these are very important considerations. They are very much in terms of uh, uh, the, fo the forefront of thinking in the SSI community and there are some standards that you can look to as to how they're being achieved. Thank you. Then last question for me, um, unless another question comes in. Um, you mentioned some of the things that um, the questions and discussions that come up in, in a positive sense about um, software architecture and so on. Um, when when you have these presentations, what is what are the common resistance points or critiques that you see that, that, that you receive as feedback? Even when you do this like very insightful short demo about how this can change everything. I mean, what, what, where do you see the resistance points for the time being? I, I think what happens for us is that um, you you have people that 
still have a, a lingering uh, uh, expectation. Maybe they've been exposed to early thinking around um, the way blockchain might work. So they think that you're going to be writing data to the blockchain. So they think you're going to be writing a, a, a transactional information to a blockchain. And 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 we have to be kind of cautious that um, those uh, those prior existing kind of expectations don't persist to our to uh, without our knowing. We kind of have to explore them. So things like yeah, but what what get what get what gets written to the blockchain? Other things that we typically find we we start talking to are well, how am I going to make money out of this? Uh, at which point um, we can start talking to the idea of the premium credential, and that's why everybody should be quite excited about the the token launch that's being um, tested right now with Sovereign. Um, so that the the kind of things that end up being resistance, we we try to uh, uncover as much as we can because you don't want them to be a surprise later. And for each of them, we will then try and uh, respond to it. One of the techniques we're using that was working very well for us, though, is that a one-hour conversation isn't long enough to go through much depth. So we will typically offer to, in a sense, take their wicked problems, take their, their challenges, if you like, and uh, consider them kind of offline and get back to them as to how we think SSI might solve them. And that gives us a, a time, if you like, to consider the way we might approach the particular problem they're, they're asking about. Um, and it gives, in a sense, some value back to them in addition to the, the one-hour meeting that we look at. Um, and that's that's certainly a, a tactic that we're using um, quite consistently now to kind of flush out any remaining issues and questions that they have. Fantastic. That's really very helpful to know. And um, I fully agree with um, everything you said about um, how technical this is today. And I uh, really think that these types of tools that, that you have developed are, can be extremely useful for everyone in the SSI space. So I will really hope to encourage everyone to use this and I'll try to distribute it as much as possible. Any final thoughts from you, John, about uh, what you would like to share or say? Uh, it's been a pleasure, Alex. I, I hope I hope some of the um, the kind of engagement process came through in the talk. It's it, it does feel odd to be doing this without actually sitting in front of people and holding these, these physical artifacts. Um, I'd encourage everybody to kind of give this approach a go. Um, don't be shy about it. It may feel a bit strange at first, but we've brought these uh, these particular things out in cafes and boardrooms of quite prestigious organizations, and it, and it's worked every time. So it's worth practicing, exploring, write your own cards, um, give it a go. But it's it, it's uh, it's a good approach. So hopefully some of that energy has come through in the talk. So I hope, I hope that's been okay. It has been absolutely. I mean, I really liked it a lot, and I agree so much with everything you said, and especially I learned a lot. So thank you so much for everyone. Um, this will be coming out in the next two hours, and I'll be sharing the link with everyone. Um, and thank you so much, John, for sharing it. Next week we will have upcoming the third of March. Um, there will be Nacho Lamillo, who's one of the lawyers for the European Commission, who will explain us um, um, and, uh, about how they have developed an ADAS bridge for SSI. And they will, he will tell us more about the ADAS SSI setup in the European Union and what the European Union is to, to pl planning to do in the SSI space. So uh, look out for that. I'll try to get it out as soon as possible. And then we also having a session maybe the week after where we will be presenting the Ibero-American Decentralized Digital Identity Report that we've developed uh, as part of SSI, the Ibero-American Blockchain Alliance and um, Blockchain Spain, um, where I've been leading that team in producing that report. And we also hope to produce more similar reports in different regions of the world for this. So um, check that out. Um, you just need to go to ssimeetup.org um, slash Ibero-American Ibero Identity. And um, yeah, and um, Carlos, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, Carlos just saying thank you, um, John, for the great presentation. And if you want to find out about all this, please just join our um, centralized social media channels, which is really ironic, but yeah, go to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Telegram, which is where we distribute and, and let everyone know about the stuff or join our newsletter where we inform about um, all the upcoming meetups. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And John, it was a real pleasure, and I really enjoyed this a lot. Thank you.